Today I'm going to be doing a video about another Doctor Who spin-off. No, not class, because that's coming later this year, and I'm very excited for it. Today I'm going to be reviewing Jay Gone Lightfoot Series 11. I'm welcome to another Big Finish review. Today I'm back reviewing something that's better than Doctor Who. I know, that's surprising, isn't it? Jig on Lightfoot, because I adore it so much, and it's just came out, and I'm reviewing it for you today, because I'm so excited. If you've seen the last review of Jig on Lightfoot Series 10, you will know my enthusiasm for this series. I adore it so much. I will go as far to say I enjoy it more than the Doctor Who audios. I just love it so much. But yeah, I've already started the compliments, I've just realised. But yeah, today I'm reviewing the recent release of Jago Knight for Series 11, which is the 11th instalment of the amazing series and um, yeah in case you don't know what Jago and Lightfoot is basically it is the Infernal Investigators George Lightfoot and Henry Gordon Jago from the towns of Wen Chiang they have their own spin-off on Big Finish and it's a bloody good one so I recommend going and checking it out for any other Jago and Lightfoot series format we have four new stories to the line and all four of them are brilliant I'm just going to say that straight away because they are and um, yeah I've not came across a Jago and Lightfoot story so far that I've not enjoyed I think that they're just a whole new level and um, it's going to be a hard thing for me to review because I'm going to be sort of selling this to you for you in order to go and buy and I think that the problem with Jago and Lightfoot sometimes is it is essentially a crime based drama in a way and um, yeah I'm going to sort of tell you about the story which in turn might in fact sort of ruin the ending so if you're one of those major Jago and Lightfoot fans I don't really recommend watching this review until you've seen it yourself because yeah I might ruin it for you from sheer excitement. So I think it's no surprise now that at the end of series 10 we had the reveal of the Master, which I was incredibly excited about, I loved it so much. And yeah, we have a whole series of the Master this time, he crops up every so often and then he's sort of the main final villain in the very ending of the story, which I'll come on to at the end. But yeah, for the first part of the series he mainly takes quite a backseat, but still quite an eerie one. So the first episode of series 11 is Jago and Son, which is written by Nigel Fares, and I was very excited for this one, because Jago and Lightfoot's got a child apparently, which yeah, um, it is his child. I thought that it was just going to be sort of something fake, but yeah, um, I loved it. I, I think that it's something brand new. I love the idea of it, and um, yeah, for the majority of the story early on, Jago and Lightfoot seem to be quite separated throughout the story, which is something that I didn't expect, but it does tend to happen quite a lot throughout this series that Jago and Lightfoot have their sort of own little things to do, and I like that because it does involve them having a bit more development in there. This one is no exception because we do have a bit of a separation to start with when they then come together and just have their brilliant comedic actions against each other. I just love their little interactions. I think that they are written brilliantly. I think the one thing about Jago and Lightfoot is the writers are really invested in the series and therefore they don't get it wrong listening to the behind the scenes and um, they say that you can either do Jago and Lightfoot but make them character shows of themselves with having too many jokes and things or you can get it just right and I think that they're just brilliant. There's some cracking one-liners in this series seriously and as always Jago and Lightfoot won't be Jago and Lightfoot without drunk people and one-liners. So kicking on to Jago and Son, Jago finds his son basically in the theatre, Jago's finished one of his performances, he comes on and um, yeah he's hiding in the wardrobe like any good son would do. But yeah basically his mother has been captured by these people and uh, we don't know who they are and um, it turns out that they're in fact sort of quite a religious idea actually and it does actually quote that on the website it is a satanist cult so it's quite a religion based story and not exactly directed at any religion really it's sort of one that's just been made up and they have some very weird rituals and um, yeah uh, we get to know a bit more about that at the very end of the story and um, it is an interesting thing because I think that Victorian London is a time for conflict and things and religion was quite heavily based then so I think it is a very relevant plot to the time period. The first time that we see Lightfoot in this series is in the Red Tavern, the famous pub which we see many times throughout this series once again and um, he actually bumps into an old friend called Barnsmore which is a woman archaeologist. I don't know if she's been in any other series, I'm guessing she probably has, either that or they've had development off screen. No, I've not actually listened to all the series of Jago and Lightfoot, unfortunately. I would love to, but I think my bank account would probably murder me. The idea of the story is there's this little dig going on to sort of preserve things, a little bit of a dig up, and it's near the Metropolitan sort of railway building, which just so happens to be the place that Jago's mother of child has been taken by the Satanist cult people. So then Jago and his son 
go off, which is also confusingly, he's also called Henry Gordon Jago. See, so yeah, uh, if we've got two Jagos and it's really confusing, basically, this is going to be a hard review to do. Tron in the story, mini Jago, well, not so mini, but child Jago, then gets sort of kidnapped as well by the Satanist cult, and the rest of the story is spent tracking him down. And um, I love the little scenes because um, what actually happens is Jago and Jago Jr. actually hide in Lightfoot's sort of little mortuary area, which I just adore for the story, because I think that there's some brilliant little scenes in there of Ben Jago and his son working together, but sort of failing, and it's until Lightfoot comes along and sees the situation that we then sort of get a bit of a kick in there. And um, yeah, we do have a few scenes in the pub, of course, and discussing things, which is nice, because I really think that settles the plot quite well. And we also have a few scenes of Inspector Quick as well, which, um, of course, throughout the series, he is actually hypnotised by the Master, in that you will obey me powers. And, um, yeah, that's interesting. He hasn't really got a part where he's constantly hypnotised, because he isn't actually aware that he is. So we do get the normal like, Inspector Quick in there as well, but every so often he goes a little bit creepy. Earlier on in the story, Barnsmore gives um, Lightfoot a little gift, and it's sort of got a little symbol on, and it's from Paris. And then that's later revealed that the little symbol, in fact, relates to the archaeological dig area that she's currently working on. So both Lightfoot and Barnsmore go to this site. The site therefore then collapses in to reveal a way to the area that Jago just so happens to be under the ground because he's gone to solve the idea for himself as he does and then um, he sort of got trapped in the ground after um, a little bit of a satanic ritual he sort of ended up falling through a trapdoor into the ground and now he's under the ground basically and um, where Lightfoot is that then collapses and Jago just so happens to be in the room directly underneath the archaeological dig and yeah, it's sort of like a metal area and it's very alien and um, it's later found out, of course, that the person that the satanic cult are sort of worshipping are in fact human and it is in fact an alien and I'm not going to really say too much about that because of course you need to find that out for yourself but yeah um, I really enjoy the Hellfire Club because that's sort of what they're called and I enjoyed the idea because it's something that the new series of Doctor Who and probably the classic series would actually not do because of offending people even though it won't really offend people because it's sort of it's, I think that religion is a really harsh topic for Doctor Who really even though it is quite religious in places picturing a certainest one I think doesn't really happen often and that's what I love about this because it's Jago and Lightfoot you've got murders and they can literally do whatever they want because it's Victorian times and it doesn't really have any limits. At the very end of the story we get a really emotional scene that I will admit I did practically share, um, shed a tear at um, and I did generally believe it happened until sort of it didn't happen at the very very end but yeah I'm going to say it now but yeah if you don't want to hear it sort of skip ahead a minute. Basically, Jago's shot, and we get this really emotional scene with his child holding him, um, and yeah, it's really emotional, because Lightfoot's there as well, and he's like, sort of quite, I think that he does probably shed a tear, he sounds very emotional, I genuinely believe Jago was dying, even though he wasn't, and um, yeah, I just love it, I think that it was such a brilliant scene, very, very emotional, it was a, a death done right, um, and yeah, I loved it, and then once he was sort of back alive again, um, we have some brilliant interactions between Lightfoot and Jago again, and it just sort of went on as normal. And yeah, that's that. And by the end of the story, Barnsmore then goes off to probably another archaeological dig, leaving Lightfoot and Jago back in Victorian London. Now, episode two is entitled Morris, and it's written by Matthew Sweet. Now, from what I can remember, I don't think I've listened to a Matthew Sweet story before on Jago and Lightfoot. And I think that the unusual thing with episode two is, of course, it's just into the start of the series, so they're allowed to do something slightly different, and that's what we get here. Of course, in the end, it does relate to the overarching plot, as do several references in the story. For example, the very first opening part of this story, we do, in fact, have the Master going to a theatre, and then we have him wearing a mask in public, of course, because he's sort of a little bit rotten and it looks a bit weird but yeah and um, he's wearing this mask thing and he's attracted to this guy because he has the Pridonian seal on his little sort of bauble device thing in case you don't know the Pridonian seal is pretty much the seal of Rassilon I just searched it into Google and I thought they were just some Gallifreyan text it turns out not it turns out that it is pretty much the seal of Rassilon which um, of course the master was rather intrigued by that and um, he sort of used that throughout the story this episode is entitled Morris because we are introduced to a character called Morris Ravel and he is a part of the, Fra the France Versailles Paris Conservatoire, I think. I don't know, it's a long word. He is a really nice character for the story, actually. Um, there's two of him, 
basically. And uh, yeah, he's sort of a villain, and then there's a good one, and um, he meets Lightfoot as he's gone to the theatre just to have a bit of chill time. And um, yeah, as he normally does, because he does tend to like the theatre quite a lot, so he goes to see this thing, and um, he has a sort of one of the overhanging things, I can't remember what they're called, um, it's sort of what the Queen sits in, what are they called, and um, the overhang seats that are sort of special and you can book them out. Going to share a box with Rebel, and then um, we get to know him, and basically it's of course a cunning plot because they sort of have a drink over the play, and then Lightfoot ends up going back to his house, which um, they have another drink, and it turns out that um, he then poisons Lightfoot's drink, he goes a bit dizzy, whilst being attracted to a sort of jar thing with a ton of sand in, and yeah, Lightfoot's out for the count for the majority of the story in the real world, and um, Jago then gets concerned, of course, because Lightfoot is like nowhere to be seen, so we then get linked to Ravel, and uh, we get to learn how um, sort of Lightfoot is in a bit of a dream sequence, he's sort of in this like forest area, and um, yeah, we later find out how in the story, which I think I may keep under wraps, I don't know if I should go too in depth into it, but basically, he meets during this dream sequence, um, Ravel again, but this time he is sort of tied up in this forest, I'm guessing by a pole, slowly dying, um, but this is a good Ravel, and basically it turns out that there is two Ravels, as I previously said, one of them is the actual Ravel, and the other one is an alien shapeshifter person that is being Ravel, just to sort of be Ravel, and uh, get away in Victorian London, and he's a bit weird, and um, yeah, he kills people basically, and um, yeah, Jago and Ellie then go on the search for Lightfoot, and I just adore Ellie in this series, and played by Lisa Bowman, she has some great cracking lines, and for example, she knocks out Ravel with a glass, which, you know, alcohol everywhere in Jago and Lightfoot, and of course it would only happen in this, yeah, we get him knocked out by a glass with alcohol in, what else could you want in life? bump into Ravel in the house, but it turns out that hang on, Ravel's already in the dream sequence, and this Ravel also pretends to be good, but it's not of course him, and it's in fact the evil one, but he's just pretending to be good, pretending to look like he's been tied up, and of course we then later find out that um, he isn't, and Jago and Ellie are basically trapped in his house, and uh, we get a really interesting scene, because um, Jago goes looking for something, and he gets up, and then he says, um, do you see this look on my face, it's the look of not being surprised, and he says it, I don't think anybody else could do the one-liners as good as Jago, um, but yeah, I think that once again, some comedic values there, even in the face of sort of a big threat. It then later turns out, when we sort of get Lightfoot freed from this sort of weird sequence involving a jar and some sand, um, it then turns out the Pridorian seal was in fact given to Marsh Ravel, um, by the Doctor as a present for Christmas or something like that. I don't believe you get to know the backstory completely to the plot from what I can remember. But yeah, um, a sort of a little bit there of just, oh, giving a little gift away, but yeah, from the Doctor, which then of course leads on to the final later on, where of course Colin comes back, which of course, if you know my channel, you will know how excited I am for that. The end of the story has two light foots as well, because we have the shape-shifting creature, which then ends the story of um, Morris basically being dealt with. Ending for the story is the master finding out about Jago and Lightfoot. He is in the theatre once again. He's um, enjoying just some entertainment, I think, and he gets a parcel sent to him, and inside is the little shapeshifter creature, which um, we then think they're going to ally up because they both want the Doctor, um, but it turns out not. The master kills him, and then um, says to the person to put it in the furnace because it's sort of some food and he puts it in like it's a very intriguing scene and I just adore Jeffrey Beavers I think he is just brilliant I think that that scene alone shows how good he is because he's very he's got a lot of suspense behind him his voice alone I just think that he's a brilliant master and once again, I'm really happy that Jago and Lightfoot have brought on the Master and Big Finish have, because I previously reviewed You Will Obey Me, and I'll admit, I never really had much of a love for Jeffrey Beavers' as Master, partly because I believe he was only in Traken, um, Keeper of Traken, and um, yeah, I never really thought of him other than um, he's the Master, I guess, but yeah. Um, and he's just brilliant. I think that he's possibly my favourite Master, maybe. Let's find out with Dark Eyes and Alex McQueen, shall we? Next episode is The Woman in White, which is written by Simon Bernard and Paul Morris, and they are quite a, a reoccurring writers actually for Jago and Lightfoot, along with Big Finish in general, and I've really enjoyed their stories so far. This one ticks boxes for me because the opening sequence, we basically find out that we have a theatre and it's haunted by a woman in white, and I think it is a very initial plot of being quite a gothic one, which fits just Victorian London, being it dark, being it quite foggy, 
fits it brilliantly. And I adore, so, so, I really adore Haunted Stories. I think they just work so well on Big Finish. Jago and Lightfoot is literally made for Haunted style of stories. And yeah, it is just a brilliant opening premise. The episode also features Bram Stoker, which um, with them sort of both having high ranking things in a theatre, he's sort of like one of the people who helps out. Then we have Jago, who's literally a control of a theatre and the leader. And they do have a bit of an ongoing relationship in the past. And um, yeah, they meet up about the fact that the theatre is haunted and he is concerned about one of their actors called Henry Irving which I do believe he is quite a famous actor, I don't know, I've not actually searched him on Google I probably should have, but yeah um, and he is basically going a bit loopy in the head and um, he is seeing a woman on stage which um, is one of the opening parts of the story which really got me intrigued straight away he's seeing a woman in white on stage that nobody else can see it's a ghost and that what goes into the haunted part and um, he is basically, when he's on stage, he's forgetting his lines he's not really doing much and he's very slurring his text and just um, being basically rather drunk sounding but also very very mysterious and he can hear voices in his head which he is being controlled by something wonder what that could be at the same time of this going on ellie is serving in the red tavern and this man walks in and he desperately wants a drink but then it turns out that he doesn't get his drink on time and basically decides to die on the floor and turn into a mummified creature like you do you know that's natural completely natural so you now have a dead body and who's brilliant at doing stuff with dead bodies george lightfoot so you have inspector quick he takes the body to the mortuary where Lightfoot is waiting and he warns him about the idea of what's going on with the body. Lightfoot then sees and he is very confused because the man is essentially completely mummified and um, that leads on to a very interesting scene of him just being very intrigued by this dead body but he seems to be a little bit off and um, Lightfoot doesn't really seem too bothered of what he would be because it's Tuesday and Tuesdays is a day off. Tuesday night is probably the night when he goes out on a bit of a pub crawl at the Red Tavern with Jago and probably Ellie as well and is then later referred to as Augustus and his solicitor comes in wondering where he's gone so he goes to the police station and then um, Lightfoot out with Inspector Quick just uh, by chance and um, we then later find out that of course he wants him to identify the body because he's wondering where he is and it is in fact Augustus and it's a very odd reaction because he sees the dead body he identifies it and then he says that he doesn't want it to get out he wants a private funeral and um, nobody's allowed to know which then Lightfoot gets rather suspicious and Lightfoot prepares the body as usual like how he would and then that gets sent to the funeral place. We then have more developments with Jago as well which once again for this story we do have a bit of a separated format. Jago is at the theatre with Bram Stoker trying to solve the sinking theatre problem whilst Lightfoot's got a mummified body and then of course when they later come together they find out that both of the cases are in fact linked. Spectre Quick and Lightfoot go off to the funeral which um, Jago and Lightfoot wouldn't be a Jago and Lightfoot story without a funeral that's another one box ticked off for this series and um yeah it is a very unusual one once again a bit more of a satanic ritual thing again the body gets set on fire lightfoot's quite confused and um it's sort of a little bit of a cult once again and um yeah he, he's very intrigued by this understandably because it's something different and then of course that's then delivered to jago and both of them are rather interested in the case whilst jago and lightfoot are at the pub bram stoker comes in and says he found henry the one that's got a bit loopy in the head going to meet somebody at night and that person is in a cloak and you can't see them but then when Bram Stoker comes along he then disappears hmm I wonder who that could be then have a brilliant scene between Lightfoot and Jago going off to essentially stalk Henry at night and then um, we have this brilliant scene where they're going along and they hear an owl in the background Jago gets quite scared and he goes oh what's that and then Lightfoot just goes an owl I just love the comedic thing in the story because I think in the second half the comedic stuff is just everywhere I was laughing so much honestly there's just so many different jokes in there even in the serious scenes which is bad because as soon as you've got a serious scene Jago just comes in says something random and you will be sent back laughing but the brilliant thing about it is you will laugh about the joke and then just get straight back into the story distract you at all from the actual premise or anything like that it's just done it's just done so well I think that it's really it's brilliant the way that they do it because I think the plots really link in well to the comedic factors Stalker, Jago and Lightfoot then go back to the theatre to find out that there is in fact a spaceship under the theatre and uh, they are trying to track down this thing and um hello phone would you like to not interrupt me please Jago Lightfoot and Bram Stoker then go under this tunnel under the theatre that's sinking and uh, they then collapse down the hole Jago finds it in the spaceship and then we get the sort of full plot reveal that um this spaceship is carrying 
these weird creatures, which um, we then later find out are sort of hypnotising Henry, who's now eating flies and he's locked up, and um, Jago and Lightfoot try to question him, don't get anything out of him except I will obey my master and whatever else um, relating to the master, because they don't know by this point. And um, yeah, he's eating flies, which allows for a very comedic, once again, a few quite, quite funny lines in there. And um, yeah, we find out about this alien spaceship, which then leads on to the very ending of the story, which I don't want to spoil for you, so I won't go into. But basically, some of it um, is linked to a wind-up lighthouse that Jago has that he's very proud of. And at the very ending of the story, once again, Inspector Quick meets up with the Master, and he has a hanky that previously went missing that was Lightfoot, and a glass from the Red Tavern, both of which, of course, have um, the DNA of Jago and Lightfoot on, so the Master can then track them down. And that leads on to the final story, where all hell is let loose. An episode of the series is called Masterpiece, ironically, because it is one. So it's absolutely stunning. It is a brilliant series finale. Of course, we have the master in there, played by Jeffrey Beavers. He is the essentially the main villain for the story, and it is such a creative idea. Honestly, Justin Richards for this story, he has literally knocked it out of the park for this one. I don't know in reference to, of course, the monthly range, because that's going on at the moment. I don't know how this links into that in any way. I don't know, of course, the master does end up escaping at the end of the story, of course, because he has to. But yeah, I don't actually know where that links in. I don't know if that physically links into You Will Obey Me, and then it goes on from there, or if it goes into any other story from the monthly range. I guess if it does, we'll find out in the future upcoming releases. But yeah, this one is just brilliant, honestly. Such a creative plot. Right away, Colin Baker isn't in it as much as you may expect. Um, he is in it technically, probably from about halfway through, and um, you just don't know it. But yeah, um, I think that for what he was on, um, it was essentially, I think it was more of an extended cameo rather than a dedicated story with Colin in. Of course, with it being Colin, he has to be on the major bar at the top saying starring, because it is, of course, Colin, and why wouldn't you put him on the major starring thing, because his doctor is amazing. So, of course, from the DNA from the previous story, some mirrors have been given to Lightfoot, one of which is in his mortuary, and Jago has been given one that's directly above his desk in the theatre. And um, Lightfoot has this very creepy vision, as um, when he's looking at a dead body in the mortuary, as he does always, he then looks up to see the mirror, and he sees himself looking pretty dead and pretty knackered and with skin dripping off and all, you know, sort of a rotting corpse, basically, of himself. He sees this, he looks very ill in it, and he's very shocked, and he thinks it's just a trick of the light to start with. But then we go to the theatre, Ellie and Lightfoot um, go in after uh, um, seeing a performance, which um, they love, they went to go and see Jago, and um, Ellie has a similar experience, but this time it's with Jago, and if she looks in the mirror, Jago turns around, and in the reflection she sees basically this dead version of Jago, and she is once again very shocked by that. Tron in the story, Ellie's back at the Red Tavern, and she's serving some people as she does. Inspector Quick's there because he's meeting somebody, and um, yeah, he's meeting somebody called Dominus comes in with his little mask on and he bumps into Ellie, notices her, he then sits down with Inspector Quick, he is under the hypnosis and then um, he says things about of course what's gone on. Um, Ellie comes over and um, he basically starts interacting with Ellie, so that she knew Jago and Lightfoot and how she should sit down and talk about it and then he hypnotises her to tell everything basically and um, even though she's busy in the pub and there's this very eerie scene when he first comes in and Ellie in fact helps him over to the table which I just found weird because he is of course in the story he is the decaying master so he is slowly dying and um, he is very weak towards the very start of the story. Now I say he's weak throughout the whole series up until a moment near the very end and then of course it goes back downhill again I guess but yeah um, he is very weak for the majority of the series which just I think Jeffrey Beavers in his voice does brilliantly. I think that he's very atmospheric and he just every scene that he's in he draws the atmosphere to himself. He's a very good actor. They go and Lightfoot have turned extremely ill. They go to the Red Tavern and they start having this talk um, earlier on after Inspector Quick has left with Dominus, and then um, they start to say basically how crap they feel, basically, how ill they are, and then um, they start talking, interacting, saying that they feel the same, and basically what the idea is, is um, the Master has infected them using this mirror. They think that it's in fact from this corpse that is brought to the mortuary earlier on in the story, but of course it's not, it's from the Master, and you see that throughout the story, which was very, very eerie, and I didn't like it at all, because it was just, um, I think the voices that, like, Jig on Lightfoot, they did sound pretty knackered, and I, I just, I found it really uncomfortable to listen to, which is brilliant, because that's what it was meant to do. One aim of the Master is they have fell that ill, the only thing that they can do is contact the Doctor, which is of course exactly what they do. So to go to his house, 
and because he has a house i didn't know that i believe that, that was probably something from jay gun like for series four but yeah um he has a house on baker street ironically and then um, they leave a message um and there's a reference to the previous series about the yesterday box and um, i do believe the year of that they called it and um as you may know if you listened to my review last time and um they have a reference to that about the letter and that's how lightfoot gets the idea of them um, they will write a letter and put it in his house and then eventually the doctor will arrive again because he always does sees the letter with the date on so then he travels back in time and then goes and helps them which is um what he doesn't do and a few days jay go like for get increasingly ill and um he's not arrived yet and um what they think is and um, they realize that inspector quick has been rather weird over the past series he has um, been places and then remembered and then wondered why he was there and then um, they come to the conclusion that it's hypnosis and it just so happens that jago currently has a performance on with a hypnosis act so they go and interrogate them and uh, and her servant and it's obviously it's not her and um, they find out that it isn't her but somehow she uses her hypnosis powers to inspector quick so then he can remember the things that the master tried to block out and he could remember the master and then that is once again how um the master is linked to the story and that's how jake on lightfoot find out about the master due to a dead body earlier on in the story and jay go like go to the sort of a little area near a church where the body was found and that is in fact where the master is and um ellie also comes along after with the people that they have met so jay go like and the hypnosis woman all go into this place and then closely followed by Ins ellie inspector quick and and the hypnosis servant and um they then go and follow them after trying to help and of course jay go like are captured by the master and his idea is to drain all the life out of them in in order to get the doctor's neuron energy which um he's not arrived yet so the doctor and um, so the master is getting pretty concerned and inspector quick walks in hypnotized with the servant and then it is of course revealed that the doctor has been there all along and i don't believe it is actually reference to how long he's been in london for um but um he's pretty much been there for the whole of the story from what we definitely know and he is being the hypnosis servant. I could tell halfway through. Um, I do believe that he actually said a few lines and I didn't even recognise him. But he had this accent on. And then um, sort of halfway through, I sort of heard the voice and I was like, hang on, that sounds like Colin. And it turns out it was. And he's just brilliant. I think that for the time where it's actually revealed and the master goes, he's here already. And you could just sense if it was directed, the camera would turn around. And um, I'm guessing he's in some kind of disguise in a way. He's then revealed there's this music, this, and then he's just there. The entrance is brilliant. Colin is the doctor. And he comes in, saves the day. Of course, they go into this machine after the doctor makes it look like the master is um incredibly in power and everything like that and it turns out that he's in fact used the power and he's reversed the mirrors so because he's got the wrong mirrors the energy is drained out of the master instead of actually put into the master because he swapped them with the um, because he swapped them with the mirrors that in fact infected Jago and Lightfoot. So then we have a bit of a reverse effect. The master has turned incredibly weak and Jago and Lightfoot are returned back to normal phase um, and normal health which is lovely. And then um, the master then escapes in the TARDIS by pushing Colin out of the way to then go off of the TARDIS clock to wherever that will be and I'm guessing that that links into and you will obey me I'm guessing I think and um, because we do in fact have a few references to you will obey me in there which is nice which is a uh, one that I previously reviewed in case you'd like to check that out the end of the series ends with a drink of the trio back united with Jago Lightfoot and Colin they're at his Baker Street house and they have um, a few glasses of wine I do think and yeah they just have a lovely little conversation on the cliffhanger of the series skip ahead if you don't want to hear it because there is a cliffhanger which I didn't expect for this one but Ellie basically turns into something and i'm guessing that that is something referencing to an earlier series sort of some type of vampire style creature it sounded like and that is where it cuts and that is where it ends and now i need it so yeah my life is just going to die now until october when the next series comes out which i need in my life now please big finish please please but yeah that's that that is masterpiece and that is summing up jay gone like for series 11 honestly brilliant i i I, do, I know some of you will probably just think that i say that it is though it is absolutely stunning i think that if you haven't got series 10 go and check out my review if you like the sound of it go and buy the bloody thing and um, it's 30 pounds from the big finish website it is a stunning release seriously links in well the master some brilliant master stories the master actually hiding in victorian london which is a very interesting thing to see and it's just genuinely a, just a stunning box set. Christopher Baxter and Christopher Benjamin are literally like my favourite actors in Doctor Who history. With Colin, seriously, this series has just been stunning. Wow. 
I'm done now. I can lay down. So as always, I will leave in the description below the link to go and order this release. It is out now. I highly recommend it. £30, I do believe £2 postage. If you only want the download, I do believe it's £25. So even better if you only want that. But yeah, highly, highly recommend it. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoy it, please do give it a big like and please subscribe if you're not already. If you have any questions, please do leave them below and I'll be sure to answer them at some point in the near future. Thanks again for watching. Let's just see you all next time. So thanks for watching and bye for now.